Welcome to tonight's Artist Talk with artist Joya Bokulahan. And in conversation with Dr. Lisa Fishman, Group Gordon Shapiro, Class of 1937, Director of the Davis Museum at Wellesley College. My name is Regina Gallardo, an art history major, student guide, Davis Museum Student Advisory Committee member, and education assistant. We will begin with a native land acknowledgement. Wellesley College occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary unceded land of the Massachusetts tribe. We recognize that we are on stolen land and we extend our gratitude to the many indigenous peoples who have rich histories here, including the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nipmuc nations. For the ongoing stewardship of the land, we commit to recognizing, supporting, and advocating for the sovereignty of the indigenous nations whose traditional territories are in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as well for the many indigenous peoples who live, work, and study in Wellesley and Massachusetts. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and commit it to holding Wellesley College more accountable to the needs of Indigenous people. This land acknowledgement was created by the Wellesley Native American Student Association, and we thank them for their labor. To participate in today's program, please note that this event is being recorded and will be made available online with closed captioning in the coming days. We're using a webinar format, and your microphone and video have been turned off during the presentation. Throughout the event, you can use the Q&A box to enter your questions and to upload other questions. We will leave approximately 20 minutes for questions from the audience at the end of the presentation with Q&A. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Fishman, Wood Gordon Shapiro, Class of 1937, Director of the Davis Museum. Dr. Fishman is at, the, at her 11th year at the Davis, where she's responsible for institutional vision and leadership across all areas of museum operations. As specialist in contemporary art, Dr. Fishman has created scores of exhibitions and authored or contributed to many publications. She earned her AD in art history from the University of Chicago, her master's and PhD in art history and American studies from the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Before coming to Wellesley, Dr. Fishman was chief curator at the University of Arizona Museum of Art in Tucson, director of the Atlanta College of Art Gallery in Atlanta, Georgia, and associate curator of contemporary art education at the UB Art Gallery in Sunny Buffalo. She began her museum career at the Department of New Media and Education at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Hello everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. First, my thanks to our students, Regina Guiardo, Ashley Bisharam, and Ryan Rowe for their help and support this afternoon. To Arthurina Fears, Curator of Education for organizing today's event, and to Amanda Gilvin, the Kerner Senior Curator and Assistant Director of the Davis for joining us today and for moderating the Q&A. Now, I am delighted and honored to have artist Julie Buffalo Head with us this afternoon. Born in 1972, an enrolled member of the Ponca tribe of Oklahoma, Buffalo Head is known for her narrative works on paper, which use allegory and archetype to create dreamscapes featuring a rich cast of characters, including trickster coyotes and rabbits, as well as turtles, deer, birds, and rodents. Buffalo Head earned a BFA with a painting emphasis from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, MCAD, in 1995, and an MFA with a painting emphasis from Cornell University in 2001. Since 1995, Buffalo Head has been the recipient of many prestigious honors and highly competitive awards, including a Guggenheim Fine Arts Fellowship in 2019 and a Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant in 2016. She has received several grants from the Minnesota State Arts Board, as well as awards from the McKnight Foundation and the Jerome Foundation. Julie Buffalo Head has been the subject of over 15 solo exhibitions, including presentations at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, and the Denver Art Museum. In 2014, the Minnesota Museum of American Art mounted a mid-career retrospective of her work, 
Julie Buffalo Head Coyote Dreams, which traveled to the Plains Art Museum in 2015. Her work has appeared in over 27 group exhibitions at prestigious galleries and museums around the world, including most recently in an opera for animals at Parasite in Hong Kong, which was also presented at the Rockbund Museum of Art in Shanghai in 2019. And in Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists, which opened at the Minneapolis Institute of Art in 2019 and traveled through 2020 to the Frist Museum in Nashville, the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC, and the Philbrook Museum of Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Buffalo Head's work is featured in the collections of major museums around the country, including the Denver Art Museum, the Detroit Institute of Arts, the Edelyord Museum, the Field Museum, the Heard Museum, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, the Minnesota Museum of American Art, the National Museum of Wildlife Art of the United States, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, the Missouri Rockwell Museum, the Tweed Museum, the Walker Art Center, and the, the Smithsonian Museum, National Museum of the American Indian, and of course, the Davis Museum at Wellesley College. Thank you, Julie, for joining me today and for joining the Davis Museum's virtual community. Welcome, Julie. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So let me share my screen. And here we go. Can everyone see that? Can you see that, Julie? Yeah, I can. OK. Um, I thought we might start here with your exhibition storytelling, Julie Buffalo Head, at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, or MIA, as they call it, mm -hmm. um, which was on view from November 2019 to September 2020. Um, and I thought that rather than reading this intro text, um, I would ask that that one of the students post it in the chat so that um, people can people can uh, review that while we're talking. We first met here um, at this exhibition, which was a highlight of my trip in late February of 2020, which feels like a million years ago, um, but was incredibly special. We spent the better part of a morning together here. You were very generous with your time. Um, I thought that so uh, as a way to get oriented, um, I could show some images here um, from the show and then we would come back to them um, because, sorry, the, um, uh, I think that the Zoom uh, has a tendency to flatten out images and it's really hard to tell scale. So I thought that these might, uh, these might do that serve that purpose for us. So um, this is White Savior Complex from 2019. Mm -hmm. And I thought this would be a good way to introduce the animal figures and the repeating decorative motifs and their narrative potential that are so distinctive about your work. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the way you approached this exhibition and how you organize the work to fill the space? Um, well, the space in the, the gallery is a pretty big space. And it's um, the curator there, Jill, um, offers it to, um, shares it with the African Museum. So they offer um, kind of exhibits that, you know, in between, you know, they take turns. And so she wanted to do one of mine. and. Um, so I kind of already knew what the space was like. So I knew I had to work big. And I was um, doing a lot of works on paper. And so this is like a homemade paper called Vokta and it's um, individual sheets, but they're glued on to a larger piece of paper. 
And um, I was working very much with um, this ribbon work, which is a um, traditional <clears throat> way of working for uh, Native women and a lot of Native societies. It, it started in the Great Lakes and it spread throughout the Mississippi River region and into where my tribe is. Um, the Osage uh, had a huge influence on the Ponca with ribbon work. And um, it's basically a, a type of ornament. Uh, they would use cloth and ribbons and cut designs out and you and fasten them to outfits or bags or different things like that. Um, and I was really fascinated with ribbon work at the time. So you're going to see a lot of that in this particular work. <laughs> so, um, and um, what are you what are you making these? What are you making the uh, the ribbon work out of? Well, I'm cutting it out of paper. And so um, traditionally they would have used um, ribbon. Um, in the uh, old times, you know, they had, um, they believed that a lot of the, a lot of the traders that um, in the old times were giving away things to natives that they seen that were unvaluable to them. So like they would give them beads and cloth and things that were out of fashion in Europe. And um, so the ribbon is um, something that the Native American women and the beads too took and made into their own art form. So they're sort of like contemporary artists of their, their time period, you know, they were able to take the materials and make something out of it. So I was always fascinated with the designs. It was a way to uh, connect to my heritage. And um, I'm interested in the idea of the designs being, they have the tendency to be opposites of each other. So like dark and light and, and I, it's just a really fascinating, um, interesting to me to, uh, to, to, to use it in a different context, you know, the way that it's traditionally used, but in sort of drawing and painting. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> did you but make all new work for this show? I did. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a lot of work. <laughs> um, a lot of the pieces have to do with um, personal stories. Um, so a lot of this work, I think, <laughs> has to do with um, the idea of um, when I was looking at these today and I was remembering them, it's often hard for an artist to go back and look at work that's you know a few years old because a lot of times you, you, you you've been there, done that, you know, you dealt with what you were dealing with. And so now you've moved on to something else. And so sometimes it's hard to revisit those things. And, um, but I remember feeling a lot of distress over kind of being, you know, being a mom, being a mother and always feeling like something's being asked of me. And so a lot of the visual imagery has a lot to do with nourishing or caring for something else or being responsible for something. It's sort of like a, my daily life is about, I often think that motherhood is about where half your brain space is taken up by another person. <laughs> and so like you are constantly um, thinking, you know, did that person eat their lunch? Did they get their homework ready? You know, did they do this, this and this? And so your brain is working in a different way when you have a kid. It's like you have this complete, it's like all the things that you're aware of for yourself kind of gets pushed aside for this other person. So in some ways I always felt like I'm a little schizophrenic, you know, like most of the time as far as like being a mom. So that's what a lot of the work is about. Um, and that's pre-pandemic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Um, so you'll see a lot of like nests and coyotes in nests because it's about the sort of mothering um, feeling and taking on um, something that's too much for you. Um, you know, like in this piece, in the piece that you're showing exile, it's sort of like, a, it's supposed to be sort of like a telephone pole, like a bird nests on a telephone pole and the coyotes come there to take his nap, you know, it's sort of like his refuge, you know, and then the crows are very bothered by it. So, um, so yeah, I was kind of taking some political things and melding them into my personal stories, which is tends to be what my work is about is, is, is sort of that 
cross pollination of, of ideas. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I thought um, it was interesting to me that we were we were introduced by uh, Todd Bokley, who mm -hmm. owns Bokley Gallery. He represents your work in Minneapolis. And um, he's, a, he's a tremendous advocate for your work and um, was very, uh, very generous in inviting me to come to the gallery and to see what you had available. This is my terrible iPhone picture for which I apologize, but I thought it would give people a good sense of uh, the way that you're working the sheets of paper and the way that the images come together. You're composing, um, you're composing in a way that is, from my perspective, really, really interesting and unusual so that you're creating space for these figures, um, but as though uh, they're, they're staged in some interesting way and it's not really about, it's not about the background. Um, it's not about the landscape around them. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about the animals and the way that you use animals in your work? Well, I draw on from my traditions of storytelling within the native. Um, I grew up with stories and it's, it's something that's a, a real concrete thing to me. And when people describe native culture, I often think of stories first because the stories contain so much information in there. It's not just, you know, a lot of people will tag on legend or myth or whatever to native stories. And I, refer, I refuse to call them that because to me, they're stories that have to deal with um, worldview. They have to do with religion. They have to do with philosophy. They have to do with actual historic events. Um, so when you deconstruct these stories, there's so much layer upon layer of, of, of uh, you know, uh, so many things I can't even get into it. But um, to me, one of the things that they often use where they had animals that were um, almost represented human beings. And so this, you know, and they had animals that would could shape shift and turn into human beings and animals. And it, it would eventually tell a story or some sort of consequence or, you know, uh, action. And I, um, so I take these characters that are from native stories. A lot of them are coyotes and deer and ones that would be familiar in my tribe and um, kind of create these stories around them. So I'm not illustrating native stories. I'm creating something new from them. I'm kind of taking the character that's there and adding upon it and making it something different. And so the, um, the use of space has a lot to do with um, my working with paper. So I started working with paper when I was pregnant with my daughter and I had to, I was forced to, I was a more known mostly as a painter, an oil painter, and I couldn't use any of those materials. So I had to turn to paper to do my work. And uh, I started using a lot of handmade paper um, and then what fascinated me about the paper was the paper was an object in itself. And I almost had a hard time actually making um, images on it because it was so beautiful in itself. So I really had pared that everything down to create sort of just concentrate on the, the figures themselves and the story that they were telling and had to have less to be about the space, but more about what was going on. So that could really focus the attention. Um, and so, uh, as I, you know, and anybody knows when you raise a child, you know, it's like, um, I had to just kind of work on paper primarily for a couple of years because it was basically me working on my kitchen table. So a lot of times this sort of like juxtapose, like juxtaposition and paper and putting paper together and using different, um, cutouts on paper and arranging paper around all comes from how I work, you know, because I had to watch a, a little kid at the same time, you know, so that was, um, so that was what I, what I was doing with the, with all that. So, yeah. yeah. Can you describe a bit the story that this piece tells? 
Yeah, this this one's based off of the Standing Rock um, protests that were um, were a couple years ago when they were protesting the the line, the oil pipeline going through, and it was um, you know the images were all over the internet, and um, I wasn't there myself, but um, I remember seeing a lot of um, which was interesting to me, which is what I was fascinated at the time. What was um, the graffiti that existed on all these signs and concrete barriers and anything that was sort of was put up by the Europeans <laughs> was like graffitied and things were written on it, you know? And uh, I was just really fascinated with that because to me, it symbolized a lot of things, you know, it was like um, reclaiming, you know, the land through this, you know, defacing the European structures, you know, so, so I was very interested in that idea and I was um, collecting a lot of images of the graffiti and uh, the, the, the signs crossed out, you know, no trespassing on Indian land kind of things like that. Mm -hmm. so I made this piece, which was sort of about all of that that protest and it was about you are an Indian land and that was one of the things they kept writing over and over again on these um, different bridges and concrete structures and signs and I was just like really interested in that and I was also interested in the idea that the the native people were also placing flags upside down and so I was interested in that, that idea that you know you um, to make the protest you were taking all the things that were imposed upon us, you know, through colonialism, and you're kind of mirroring it back on the, those people. And so that's kind of what I was trying to do with this piece. Um, so yeah, and then I think the animal, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, it's so strong. And um, I mean, it's, you know, I'm really, really thrilled that it's become part of the Davis collections. Um, and. I think um, I'm very interested to hear what students want to know about it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I am very curious, um, but I also, like we showed uh, Sky Hopinka's piece about um, Standing Rock and it was really interesting. I've heard that students would sit and watch, you know, just watch this right over and over um, this film and it was fascinating to me that you've created an, an entirely different, but absolutely like dovetailed kind of perspective on that, that experience. Mm -hmm. Let me go on. <laughs> so here's, here's the Cody with the tutu again, mm -hmm. <laughs> from 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and this is Trickster Showdown. I wonder if you could talk about making this work. Well, this was a, a when I was invited by High Point Prints in Minneapolis to come in and do a series of prints. And I hadn't worked with printmaking since I was in, uh, like an undergrad. So it was like a long time. And um, so I was doing these um, lithographies mostly. And this is a, this is a, um, a piece that um, was technically challenging <laughs> because um, all the white that you see in it is actual paper. And so the dark, sh um, the blue lines and the pink and stuff is all ink. So it's a reverse of usually how you work. And so I had to scratch into a piece of film to create that, um, that image. Um, this is a, uh, this was a lot about um, feelings I was having at the time. Um, of being biracial, of being from two different cultures. I, I was often um, felt like I never belonged to either one because I kept feeling a lot of resistance from either side, you know, as, as far as acceptance. And so this is sort of a piece about that, those feelings inside myself. And so one side, and I usually do this, I do this where I create these dichotomies and these like um, actual diptychs. Whereas like one character will have traditional dress and then another character will be dressed in tutus or, you know, frilly things. It's sort of that, um, th that idea of uh, juxtaposition, that idea of opposition, that, that, that those feelings in yourself of, of feeling, you know, just 
feeling tension over a lot of things. And so that's what this piece was a lot of about. And, it, and some of it also references my child, my daughter, and the idea that, you know, when you're around little kids, they have, um, they're just, they're, it's not just their imagination, it's that they actually live in this little world, you know, where they can just take anything and dress up in it and become something. And that was interesting to me because that's sort of how like native stories are sometimes is that they can take little pieces of everything and then make a story out of it. And so that's kind of what I was doing with these prints, right? Um, during this time, so. Is that two pieces together or is the line cut through it? It's a diptych. So there's two separate prints that are um, put together. It's me meant to create the sort of tension between the two. Mm -hmm. to um, animal figures, so. I thought maybe, you, you told me that you've made, um, you made four of these lithographs in a residency at High Point. Uh, Actually, I made nine. You made nine. Oh. Yeah, I don't have them all, but. Four. Yeah. So I thought, um, what, what was the, what was, what is High Point? Maybe you could explain to people and then talk about what your residency was like. High Point is a um, nonprofit here in Minneapolis. Um, it's a print shop that's run by um, Carla McGrath and Nicole Rogers. And um, they invite um, different artists in to do, you know, a, a print or a series or something that they can work with you. And so you end up working with master printers and um, to create a, a, a work and, um, so I was invited to come in and, you know, it was a little awkward at first, I think, because I, I think when you're not used to working with a different medium, you can get really hung up on issues, you know, technical issues, different things that really stifle your process. And um, I think the thing I've learned about printmaking over the years is to not approach it like I want to just make something that's a reproduction of what I normally do but I want to actually use the medium to make its own new thing. Mm -hmm. So you really have to get to know what you're working with. And so I was working with litho and plates and drawing and thinking backwards and, you know, thinking how things would go together. I'm usually an additive person. So I usually will start with one figure and then add things and actually collage paper onto paper. Mm -hmm. And when you're printmaking, a lot of times you have to think the opposite way because you're thinking about, you know, how you can't just put ink on top of ink. You have to think of all those steps through beforehand. So, um, so yeah, it's just, it was a, I really liked it. It was a really fun process and, um, yeah, and I'm continue, I'm making prints with them now again. So yeah, I, I, I wish that more artists could experience the printmaking process. I think it opens up a lot of um I just think artists changing mediums is a is a is a when you can experiment with that and do those things, it's really helpful to you to your process. So and what is uh, coyote doing here? What's happening? <laughs> this is called revisionist history lesson, and I was really into this idea of these shadow puppets. Um, I think that's another nod to my mothering. <laughs> so, but he he's um, kind of telling a story within a story. So he's telling the story of the Columbus ship being forced to turn around in the opposite direction. So. Um, so yeah, he's he's kind of doing it in this very simplistic way with the shadow puppets. So that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, this these this piece is um was a very big piece. It's pretty pretty large for a lithograph. And um, again, I'm using a lot of the shadow puppets as sort of a you know iconography. You know, the native on a horseback. I was interested in you know some of this. Um, images that always get put out there on natives, you know, that, um, uh, you know, like they're just in the way they're symbols, you know. So I was researching that a lot. Um, this particular piece is about sort of feeling inadequate and not feeling the, the deer has horns that are actually a branch and it's fastened onto his, his head. 
and um, the other animals are sort of mocking him or kind of having a fun time and he is not, you know? And it's sort of about this feeling of, uh, again, of like um, not being able to live up to things, you know, feeling like you're not good enough in this world, so. I think it's fascinating and distinctive that, you know, you're using, you're managing to, to use a vocabulary, to develop a vocabulary that crosses very fluidly between what's super personal to you and what's, you know, kind of recognizable to anyone else. And then creating these narratives that let people in, but also make them work, make them think about what's happening. Yeah, I, 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 a lot of people, I think, mistake my work for something because they often, you know, I'll use animals a lot. And I think they think, oh, cutesy animals, you know, but my whole purpose is in a way to draw somebody in, but the actual content of my work is not cutesy. You know, it's not, people often use the word whimsical when they describe oh, work, which actually irritates me because I don't, I don't see it that way. I see it as that there's a, like a, a, almost like a dark humor to my work. There's like a, there's an undertone, you know, and a serious undertone and sometimes, and, but it's infused with a little bit of humor and a little bit of, you know, irony. And I think that's what, again, I reference the native stories. If you read a lot of native stories, they often contain that. They contain very serious things, but it's laced with a little humor you know, little fanciful kind of things that happened in him. So, so I guess that's my objective with a lot of these pieces is to draw the viewer in enough to kind of think about, well, wait a second, what is going on here? You know, so. Yeah, this one is called, that particular piece is called Fox Tussle and it's about, um, so I was thinking about how a lot of native people view the turtles back as um, a symbol for the continent of the earth. And, mm -hmm. and so some of these pieces are personal and people won't probably understand them unless I talk about them. <laughs> but but uh, I was thinking a lot about um, my own tribe and the state of Nebraska. Is there. The Ponca people are originally from Nebraska, Northern Nebraska. They were removed in 1876 and forced 500 miles to Oklahoma. And um, I was thinking a lot about, you know, the, those are county lines in the state of Nebraska. And I was thinking a lot about how all these pieces of land are divided up into these lines. And, and, um, and I was thinking how similar that is to like these cookie cutter houses. Cause I grew up in the suburbs and we lived in a cookie cutter house. And there's a lot of lines and you have the same house for like 50 blocks, you know? And I was thinking about how this kind of happened because the way native people see land is that land is it's belongs to itself and there's no view of property. And so I've often had this sort of trouble in the world and that, you know, I don't think like other people because of the way I was raised, you know? So like being raised in the suburbs was like, horrible experience for me because you know I just didn't have this understanding the way that those the people around me did you know that property is so important to them there are lines in the sand that you draw and that this is mine and this is yours and and I just never get I never got it so this piece is sort of about those things so it's a pretty magical way to to map out like a, a huge life ton of experience <laughs> yeah, yeah. right yeah so this is the garden from 2017 mm -hmm. um i thought you might want to talk about this piece like very fully <laughs> but there's a lot in here yeah well it's a yeah, I've talked about it a lot. Um, <laughs> um, this piece was done right at the time that the Walker, Walker Art Center here in Minneapolis was having some issues with, um, they had commissioned Sam Durant to put up a piece in the sculpture garden. And uh, Durant's sculpture was a gallows. 
And so a lot of the local native people were enraged that he would put this particular piece, which is based off of um, uh, a historical event that happened in um, Minnesota many years ago in um, 1862, where um, 38 men, Dakota men were hanged and it was the largest mass execution in United States history. And um, so you have sort of the symbol that would be in a major museum in Minneapolis where you would have tourists walking around and snapping photos and taking pictures and you know you know it was just it was just kind of a weird I don't know if that they really thought it through as far as choosing that piece for this you know I mean it it might have been all right to have it as an exhibit but an actual permanent sculpture in the sculpture garden seemed a little strange you know I know that the native people were very angry about it and um thinking that was really disrespectful mm -hmm. and um so I did a piece about it and it was sort of um about um one of the things that fascinated me about the sculpture garden is that when you go there or you Google it or you, you what it, all you see are people taking selfies of themselves in front of these sculptures. And I couldn't imagine how it would play out with this, you know, Sam Durant sculpture there, how they would be taking selfies. It almost like they're trivializing what happened, you know? And I know that maybe wasn't his intent as an artist, but it was definitely something that was going is going to happen you know if you had it out and so I made a piece where these um there's this sort of like woman you know being um fed the cherry and spoon which is a Klaus Oldenburg sculpture in the garden by these rabbits and the rabbits sort of symbolize these spirit rabbits sort of like the spirit of the men that may, may have died in Mankato and um and I just felt like she's being spoon fed, you know, spoon fed something to say, you know, well, yes, that th this is okay, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like, and so, um, and, but then I'm asking questions as I go along in the piece. So like, there's another sculpture that says love because it's questioning, is this love? Is this um, all right? Is this appropriate, you know? And then I included a last sculpture that was in the sculpture garden, this um, Katarina Fish, fresh um, chicken thing and the coyotes and my piece, you know, devouring the, uh, the chicken. So it's just a lot of questions. It, I guess I was being particularly critical of um, or critiquing the walker and its choice and um, just placing it in context to how somebody of, you know, a different culture might see these things, you know, that your choices matter. And so um, I guess that's the, po the point I was trying to make, you know, with the piece. It seemed impossible to me that anyone thought that putting up a scaffolding for hanging a gallows would be fun, like next to the spoon and cherry, for example, right? And that there wouldn't be an outcry about something that referenced one of the darkest moments in American history. I mean, yeah. the, those men were hanged on Abraham Lincoln's orders, which I didn't know anything about until I moved to Minnesota, I will say. Right, right. Well, I think that just, you know, um, I think things have consequences, you know, like, and you have to be, I think that's what people are being made aware of now with a lot of social issues that are going on in the world, Black Lives Matter, Me Too moments, is that there are consequences to things and that you have to be, have a certain amount of awareness. And so if you go into it without that awareness, you know, like when making artwork, you can have to be conscientious of, you know, where you're putting this work and who are the people here before you, et cetera, et cetera. And, I just don't think that was done at the time. And I think, you know, I think that they, maybe they've learned their lesson a little. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 yeah, so. So that was the piece of yours that was in Hearts of Our People, mm -hmm. um, which was a groundbreaking exhibition that centered the art making experience of native women 
um, from the ancient to the contemporary and highlighted matrilineal relations and brought a feminist lens to native art making. Um, the exhibition included 117 works from 50 communities and uh, the garden, which we just looked at, traveled to all four venues. Um, the garden attracted a lot of attention and I have the uh, URL to uh, pop into the chat so that people can see the article in the New York Times, which reviewed it. Um, this was an, an sort of unbelievable uh, exhibition, not least because it was so long in coming. And I went to Minneapolis particularly to see it um, because it seemed to me that there's such a robust native arts community in Minnesota that like this should have happened, you know, 50 years ago, um, but that it was happening. It was an opportunity to celebrate. What was it like to participate as an artist? <laughs> well, I didn't have to do very much. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, well, the thing about that particular exhibit, I think, is that, um, which the idea that I like now is that um, Jill and Terry, who the main curators didn't just leave this exhibition up to one curator or a team of curators. What they did was they brought in a whole team of people of native women, native women artists, you know, and this is really traditionally how native people would do things. You know, native people don't, would often have when there would be, you know, something that they needed to, to debate about, they would bring in many people to come to make a decisions. Um, and that's the thing I liked about it. Um, I think what's hard as an artist in the world today is that you're at the mercy of one particular curator. You know what I mean? Like you have to be in their good graces sometimes to get shows. Right. It gets a little difficult at time because you can't be, I mean, I just am not that type of person where I can just be um, so socially connected that I ha I'm in everyone's good graces. I mean, there's just going to be people that don't like your work. That's just the way that it is. But we give those curators a great deal of power. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I feel like the artist loses a lot of power in that process. And so I like it when a group of artists, a group of women can come together and make decisions about what was going to be in the show, how it was going to be arranged and that to me felt really positive. And I think that showed through, not just, it wasn't just all the visual, you know, the wonderful visual part of the exhibition, but just the care that went into it. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't feel like one person's vision. It felt like a, a community. And that's really important, I think, when you think about art and shows and the future is how you can include those things, you know, so. Yeah. I think that um, it broke a lot of ground that way too. Mm -hmm. It's creating a different and um, very transparently collaborative model for others to see. Uh, the focus on female making at the heart of this exhibition kind of sets up my next question mm -hmm. about the feminist politics in your work. Mm -hmm. um, these, this one and the next one, I think, make that really explicit. So, why I hate bras <laughs> from 2018? Yeah, yeah the, I was um, reading a lot of Roxanne Gay at the time, <laughs> their bad feminist book. And um, I was really, um, you know, I was interested in, because I have these feelings in myself as a woman, you know, like that I have to be a certain way. And, um, and I think what she was trying to say in her books, if I can remember correctly, is that, you know, it was okay to still, to like pink and still be a feminist, you know? <laughs> like she was trying to draw these, lay out this way that you, you, you know, you're, I don't know. Anyway, I can't remember exactly everything because I just, I'm not in that headspace right now. But I think that what I always was trying to do was like um, talk about, you know, that I was, 
I'm a woman and I'm a feminist, but I still like certain things, you know, I still like dressing up sometimes. I still like putting on lipstick or whatever, you know, and I wanted to allow myself to have those things, but also critique them in the same way. And it doesn't have to be this where I make choice A and then choice B is that it ha can be a fluid thing. You know, I can still be a feminist and be all these things. So I think that's what I was trying to talk about with these pieces. Um, yeah, and so then the the the, the G string underwear is <laughs> something I found from from an internet search. It says all you can eat. It's sort of like you know, it's that's subtle. <laughs> yeah, all these things that you get exposed to as a woman, where you just sigh, you know, you do, you suddenly want just want control over your own body and image and everything, you know. So, yeah. So we've been talking mostly about works on paper, but it's nice to have an opportunity to look at the work that's also painting. So your BA and your MFA were both really focused on painting um, and you stopped painting for a while. Can you talk about what it was like to come back to it? Well, I did these, most of these pieces were for the Denver Art Museum. And so he, um, sort of encouraged me to do painting for his show. <laughs> and so I was like, um, I hadn't done painting in a while and um, it, it's really difficult to get back into a medium that you haven't done for a while because there's things about a medium that you just know, you know, it's like having a spouse or something. You just know what they like, they don't like, you know how to work them and how to not to work them, <laughs> you know? And that's what painting is like, it, there's all this, there's things about it as a technical medium, as it how paint it goes on a surface, how composition. I had to explore space again. Mm -hmm. so a lot of my um, things were on paper, and that was an object, but this was like about the paint. So I had to figure all that out. So I was really just touching on it, it with these pieces. I didn't get enough time to work on them, but um, they that's what it was like for me. It was like um, revisiting something that I was not used to doing for a very long time. And, and I had to learn quite a few things along the way, <laughs> you know, so, and I'm still learning about painting, you know, even though I'm call myself a painter, I'm just, you know, sometimes it's, it's a mystery to me how I even get these things done. So <laughs> it's really fascinating to see the the shift and the moves, you know, between printmaking or works on paper and these paintings. This one, straight legs, is 53 by 128 inches. This is huge. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, they usually, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I had to work big because there was a big space. Um, but yeah, it's that's a lot of work that goes into a painting. You know, you have to lay a lot of paint down. And you have to think about all those things, about how something affects the space and, and its size and, you know, all that, so. It's so clear to me though that you're a painter. I mean, you may, <laughs> you may be frustrated by it, but <laughs> it's like, these paintings are fantastic. They're just gorgeous. Um, this is A Little Medicine and Magic from 2018 and it's 52 by 72. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one was, is, I was, it, it, the whole, exhibition was based off seven paintings and I um, had to do, I was basing it off of my clan system in my tribe and we have seven clans. So each clan has sort of um, rights and responsibilities. Sometimes there's animal symbols that go with the clan and this particular clan, the symbol was a skunk. And so I was doing these <clears throat> sort of, um, again, dealing with feminism a little bit, you know, um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the in the in, in Ponca tradition, there was always this thing called the mark of honor, which was like some young woman of um, if a man in the tribe did a lot of good deeds, like he gave of himself, he um, his and he was he did over like a hundred good deeds. His um, daughter was given a tattoo on her head forehead. And so it was like called a mark of honor. And she was considered extremely beautiful for the tattoo and extremely honored for her to have it, you know? So it was kind of a throwback to an old tradition. And I was putting the tattoos on the skunks and, you know, so 
That's yeah. sort of what it's about. I, you know, some of this stuff I didn't get to explore as much as I wanted to, some of the symbol, symbolism, but um, I did my best at the time, I guess. <laughs> so, but yeah. Well, I think they're, they're so um, full of suggestions and clues. Um, the titles are also, your titles are also really distinctive and fantastical. I mean, really, I, I wonder, you know, sometimes you're using words within the works um, mm -hmm. and then you're also using words to prompt the viewer, um, but you don't ever really tip your hand. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, um, that's really clever and really distinctive about your work. Uh, this one is called Mother of Deceit. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about your titles and the way that you're strategic about those titles? Um, sometimes titles come to me when I'm working on a piece because it's just something kind of like a nickname I give something and then it's sort of like just sticks and then I just refer to it as um, it's like you give something a name, you know, like it's its own being you know so sometimes that's what happens and other times it just kind of um evolves from whatever the content is and what I think um it might be about I think with this piece I was um doing I was supposed to be in a show which had to do with the self-portrait and so I was sort of doing a, a self-portrait sort of thing and um so the, the whole mother thing was again I was like I part of my very being is being a mother. Um, and I don't laud it over people, you know, like I'm a mother, you know, like I always try to talk about how being a parent is full of difficult things as well as positive things, because a lot of times they don't want you to talk about the difficult things with parenting because they want you to seem like, you know, having a kid is just this ideal thing. And it's not, it's just, it's a lot of work. There's so much in, involved in it. And so, I think that mother of deceit comes from that kind of that, um, uh, those feelings, you know, like how I feel like I'm putting up a show sometimes, you know, for others, for um, how I view, you know, how I'm in the world, you know, how we all are kind of deceitful in some way. So, so yeah, I mean, that's sort of how that title came about with this particular piece. And this one, Mother of Veracity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was sort of, it's the same thing where I'm kind of trying to do this, I, this self portraiture, it put myself in the work, but it's not necessarily put myself in the work where it's a concrete, it could be that I'm the figure or it could be that I'm the, you know, the coyote or wolf, or it could be that I'm the rabbit. It's just that some part of me is in there. And um, I think this part was just about um, sort of like, you know, uh, again, this idea of motherhood, the nest, and then the coyote, coyote or wolf or whatever sits on the nest and he's licking her foot and she's sort of pinching this rabbit so hard that it bleeds, but she's also pinching her arm so hard that it bleeds. It's sort of like, it's sort of just all these uh, images mixed up in one, you know, all these things, almost like a film for me. It's how I see things. That's why I create the images I do. It's like, they don't always make sense, like in terms of a linear story, but sometimes they all reference things in life. Like um, it references feeling like um, not good enough or beating yourself up over something or, you know, um, feeling like you're not a good person or um, that kind of thing. You know, there's all, all that is in there. So it's interesting to me that um, it's a very, these are very strange. Like this is a very weird painting. <laughs> and <laughs> which is, I think probably why I love it. But, um, but it's, you know, there's this violence in it and yet it's not repulsive, right? Mm -hmm. It's not repugnant visually or in the idea that's being presented to you. And there's something that is mysterious happening with the ghost, the ghost, uh, ghosting at the edges, the shade, the shadows of, um, of the rabbits, for example. Um, it's really compelling. So rather than, you know, turn away from a sort of 
violence, you feel compelled to look more closely. Yeah, I think some of that has to do with like personal things. I think sometimes I think about how I ended up in the world and I ended up a person who, you know, um, when bad things happen, I take things out on myself. And that's always been a thing in my life is I, you know, I never, I don't yell at other people. I have a tendency to just, you know, take it on myself and encapsulate it in here. And it's almost like a self abuse in some ways, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so some of the work, I think, references that a little bit, you know, it's about the, the idea of self-harm and, and why you, why would you do that? You know, it's like, but sometimes you only have yourself when you want to get out feelings, you know, it's like, so some of it's kind of about that. It's real personal, but it's, um, and it's psychological, you know, so. Nourished. Yeah. Yeah, I was interested in the um, Romulus and Remus um, statue of the, you know, the the the, the chat children drinking from the wolf. And so here I have like a coyote wolf figure where these ermine are drinking from her. And it's again about that mother feeling like I'm being drained, you know, <laughs> like like I'm responsible for so many people and so many things. And um, the other, um, yeah, so that's kind of where, where my work is. Um, I mean, I always bring those things in, but it's just those, those are the feelings that grip me at the time, you know, so. And somehow here, the, um, the coyote wolf figure has now become really feminine and embodied in that way, mm -hmm. which is yeah. interesting, kind of morphing. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I don't usually do things like this. <laughs> so it was an unusual for choice for me at the time. But yeah, I just I just wanted it to be more vulnerable, I guess. So yeah. An exile. Yeah. Yeah, this is a little quirky piece. <laughs> I think I was interested in the idea of movement and I was using these ghost figures. I was actually what I was doing is a um I was cutting out a lot of, a lot of these things are cutouts and put on paper. And I was doing that for a while because I do the ribbon work. I cut out tons and tons of um, designs over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I would cut out these animal shapes. And so I'd have like, you know, many, many of these shapes. And so I started layering them on top of each other, creating a ghost image, sort of like if there was movement or, you know, just the, if you think you saw something, but you didn't, you know, kind of like that, you know, it's sort of like a, a slight vibrancy to things. So I think that's what I was trying to do with some of that um, dual images that were in the, in the work. And the tension between these figures who clearly are eyeballing each other, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah, you just need a place to have sanctuary, don't you? <laughs> Even if you're a coyote. <laughs> so, yeah. I thought we would um, close with this, which is um, a very recent print that you did at High Point, uh, Tone Deaf. Mm -hmm. And I'm delighted to say that um, I called and reserved one the other day for the Davis. So that's really exciting. Can you talk about this one since it's what you've done most recently? Yeah. Um, I was doing some work. Um, I think that primarily had to do with, a, well, I had to do with a lot of things. I was thinking a lot about how, you know, this, I was doing this work during the COVID, um, you know, shutdown. And so I would um, do a lot of work at home and then go in and direct them to do some stuff, you know? So we were working pretty safely, but um, I was thinking a lot about how disproportionately Native Americans were dying of COVID at the time. You know, if you look at the Navajo Indian reservation, it was like decimated by the COVID. And I think a lot of the reason for that is because Native people tend to live in large extended families and um, there's a lack of, health um, services to some people. And um, so I was kind of using the one coyote as sort of like holding up a mask saying help to represent that disproportion. And then there's another coyote that's 
draped itself with these American flags um, upside down, laying upside down with the, his little sign that says tone deaf. And it was sort of about this polarization that seemed to exist in the country where there was um, people on one side, people on the other side, um, and how some people took the wet and mask wearing and politicized it. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of unbelievable to me that they would do that because to me, you know, when you um, are facing a crisis like this, you know, um, how does it, you know, you're helping somebody by wearing a mask, you know what I mean? But they made it into a political event and they wave their little flags and say, this is about freedom. And it, it just brought in a lot of feelings for me. And um, so the figures are mirroring each other. It's sort of like this, this um, one's in one side in a, in, a, in a position and the other's in the other. And it was just, a, you know, it was just a lot of feelings about that whole time period, you know, that whole Donald Trump era, the whole, you know, <laughs> people not really listening to each other. There's just like one or the other, you know, who can tell the loudest. Um, and meanwhile, people are dying, you know? So I was just like, I just had to make a piece about it. So that's kind of um, how the piece evolved. So, yeah. I'm really glad you did. <laughs> yeah I can't wait to see it in person yeah yeah well thank you Julie yeah. um I think we'll I'll stop sharing my screen and um, we'll invite Amanda to join us and see if we have questions hi hi Thanks for inviting me uh, to um, moderate this evening. We already have several questions, uh, which you guys can both see in the chat, but you don't have to because I will ask them out loud. Um, and uh, yeah, they're already a, a, a addressing kind of a range of both conceptual and formal aspects uh, of your work, Julie. Uh, the first one came in very early uh, in your conversation while you were discussing the uh, Standing Rock pipeline, pipeline protests uh, and asks, uh, what's, and I'm gonna add something to it. Um, uh, and a, a, an attendee has asked, would such protests qualify as their own form of land acknowledgement? Uh, which, I, I, this was before you mentioned the uh, land belonging to itself. Right, and in this conceptual outlook. So, I, in this short question, I actually see a lot of questions <laughs> uh, about land. And I think we would all love to hear more from you about uh, your views on land. Uh, belonging to itself, if you'd like to comment on uh, on like current institutional practices of land acknowledgements as part of that, it would be also a bit very interesting. Um, oh, I don't know how to get into that, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's a complicated issue, I think, because um, for one, I think what people um, don't understand is that, um, it, well, some people understand, not a lot of people understand it, is that um, native nations are sovereign nations. And so each um, individual tribe has its own system of government, its own system of doing things. It's, and so um, with um, Standing Rock, you know, I mean, when I said pe Native people um, view land upon it as is on itself, you know, it's its own thing and they don't view it as property. Um, I think what was in, given to the people in Standing Rock were treaty rights and they had a certain amount of land that was given to them. Um, and I think what they're trying to do is protect the land that they have and what they're given. And so I still think they have this sort of worldview that the land belongs to itself. I just think that they're being um, protective of their, um, you know, I don't even really know how to get into it, to be honest with you, but, you know, <laughs> um, I'm happy that people do land acknowledgements. I just think that they need to consult with Native people sometimes first. So um, that just, um, don't be afraid to ask questions. That's what my, my thing is, is that I'm, you know, my group and a family of educators, my dad was 
a history professor. My mom's an anthropologist. And um, I don't, I think that you need to ask questions of native people all the time. You know, if you're unsure about how something is, you're more than, it's good to ask, you know, so yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the next question from uh, my colleague, Dr. Heather Hughes, uh, actually links to that question and leads it to uh, some for uh, formal aspects of your work. Could you speak to the role of negative space and absence in your work, particularly as it pertains to land and landscape? Um, I'm not, I'm not really sure how to get into that one either. I mean, a lot of the negative space is, you know, I kind of explained a little bit. It's sort of about um, that I didn't want to deal with space and I didn't want to deal with um, uh, just fill, filling in things. I wanted to draw attention to the characters. And so um, to do um, pieces about land, I've done this in the past where, you know, I've had to, I had to deal with sort of the um, uh, land and, and it's really hard to do and like with characters. So for me to do it was to, the easiest way to do it was with these shadow puppets and to create these narratives and these characters sort of like in these little microcosms. Um, so I think that's what I was trying to do. I don't know. I mean, um, I'm attracted to negative space and negative space is interesting to me. Like, it's like I said, I'm very interested in, in um, the object that something is. I mean, I don't, you know, I like for me, paper is a beautiful thing and it can be just itself in itself. And if I could just hang paper up a museum, I might, you know, and, and just like, but I, you know, so I don't know, but yeah. I think that's so interesting about the shadow puppets too. Like, because a shadow puppet can be made out of, of a lot of things. But as you were talking about the paper, like I was reading them as a depiction of paper. I, I don't like on, on these works on paper. Uh, is that accurate? Are, are those engaging? But they're certainly engaging with this kind of two D in the three D as well. Um, yeah, a lot of my work ha has to do with like um, picking out objects from my life that I have around, especially from my daughter. So a lot of times there's images of tutus and puppets and shadow puppets and things like that that are all just things I can grab off the floor, you know. So um, and I think that, you know, it's sort of like I'm a kid like my daughter, I'm, a, I'm very imaginative. I'm a kid, I'm telling a story, but I'm actually an adult. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm just, I'm, it's like, it brings out the child in me in a way that imaginative person who you can just play for hours with, with objects, you know what I mean? So. But this gets back to your point about your work not being whimsical, right? Is that children's play is serious work. And, and, and not always whimsical itself, right? So I think that's really... Yeah, yeah, well, I always thought that kids work out things through play. And so, you know, some of that, you know, I always think about that. You know, my daughter comes up with all these like, you know, wild stories and like characters doing things. And, I'm, and, and I always kind of do a second glance thinking, ah, what is this, you know, this crazy stuff. And then I think, yeah, maybe she's just working out some stuff you know, so <laughs> it's probably what I do, you know, working out things uh, through uh, painting and drawing, so. Great, um, I, I, the next question is also, oh, it, and um, Heather has chimed in. I, I, I did not preface uh, by telling you that she, she uh, is a works on paper specialist. So, so she chimed into the chat that um, she too loves paper. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I want to encourage all of our attendees uh, to feel free to uh, put your questions in the Q&A box uh, as well uh, as the chat. I'm monitoring both. And the next question is from Lisa Brink. Uh, and um, also has a very formal slant. Uh, so what determines the proportions of the two rectangle shapes? So we see that a lot in your work, right? In, in the negative space is often divided. So can, can you tell us more about that process? Um, 
I think what I what I what I've tried to do is it's some of it's based off a of Native American worldview about having um, a um, you know there's always these parallel worlds that sort of exist. There's like an animal world, the human world, um, and that comes back to some of the things that they do with um, these shapes and these ribbon work. It's night versus day. It's mother versus father. It's it's you see this symbology a lot in Native. Um, stories, you see it in their art, you see it in all kinds of places. And so um, I'll sum it up sort of like this. Um, I always thought that I'm particularly attracted to the coyote figure and the coyote figure is always very interesting to me in native mythology because he represented not black or white, but what it meant to be in the gray. He was, uh, gluttonous and selfish and stingy, but at the same time, he created worlds and made things happen. You know, he, he was a, um, a contradiction. And so I always thought that that was what Native people meant, um, what they described as what being a human is about. And so they just fastened it into this character of Coyote. And um, so that's kind of what I do with my work is I'm so interested in that idea that things are these opposite worlds and, but we're all, we, we exist in both of them. And so a lot of my work is about that. It's about having a dichotomy about having one thing or the other and sort of um, showing that, that tension that exists and, and the ability to move through those worlds, I guess, is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so yeah, some, so that's somewhat, I do a lot of diptychs um, um, it's interesting for me to do one side and approach it from one angle and then do the other side in a totally different way. So, yeah. So do you want to chime in on your experience as a, a viewer and art historian as you like encounter these, the, the visual divides or, or the negative space in the work? Are you asking me to chime in on that? Yeah, yes, if you'd like. <laughs> Um, hmm. I don't know about the visual divide. I mean, I think, um, I think there's, there's something, there is this interesting tension that I find in the work there, right there. Um, and I think that, um, watching both, both the material, uh, construction of the work, um, and the, the ideas and the stories and the figuration within it um, function in that tension. And I'm really, I find that really attractive. I think that's, um, it kind of opens in an interesting way. So that, you know, this, I don't know who your presumed viewer is, but I think um, a presumed audience um, can bring can bring something of herself to the experience of looking, and then, um, and then has to ask you, which I like. Uh, so I'm so pleased that our um, uh, colleague and uh, printmaker, uh, Professor Phyllis McGibbon, is uh, with us tonight, uh, and she thanks you both so much for this discussion, and uh, she wonders how. Or if preparatory drawing operates as part of your investigation, especially since the freshness of your drawing is evident even in the painted work. Do your images come together mostly as you work full scale, or are there smaller studies that lead up or diverge from them? Um, it sort of depends. It's all over the place. Um, I used to be where like I had um, a clear idea of what I wanted to do and then I'd have to sort of like sketch it out and then have it it'd have to be like a po like a, a snapshot in my brain. You know, every little piece had to be in there. And as I've gotten older, the way that I work is sometimes I just focus in on one thing, like one figure. And then I just make that. And then sometimes I see a story that comes out of the work. And so I kind of work in both ways, you know? So um, sometimes I do preparatory stuff and then sometimes I just let it happen, you know? So it kind of depends. I'm sort of liking lately how 
stories just kind of happen um, because I often have too high of expectations when I get kind of like controlling about, um, you know, when I see these snapshots in my head, I get, I, if it isn't like how I imagined it, I get very disappointed and then I get kind of unhappy and with myself and get too perfectionistic as an artist. And I think now I am allowing stories to sort of happen and sort of making it up as I go along sometimes like, or just responding to things that I see in paint or respond to things I see in, on the paper. And those stories are more surprising to me. And they're like, you know, it just came out of somewhere. And I just, I really like those, those, those things now because um, I don't, I'm, I, I'm not so hard on myself about it, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So. Great, thank you. Uh, well, I have a question um, that I'd uh, love to hear from both of you about. I was really excited to hear about uh, the impact of Roxanne Gay uh, on your work. Um, and I, I, I wonder for this question, uh, maybe uh, Lisa, you can start and uh, Julie can um, uh, wrap up um, with this question about um, how, so Lisa, in your case, um, in you know changing feminist theories like how our um like uh, like our um uh, ongoing understanding around feminism and sexuality like uh in impacting your interpretation of uh, julie's work and and julie i'm of course very interested to hear from you uh then um um more about your experience of, of reading uh gay and other feminist uh, writers, our, our students thought to be reading. Lisa? Um, well, I think, you know, it, it's interesting to me to look at this work through a feminist lens because Julie's, she, she's embodying, you're embodying um, attributes in animal form. Sometimes there are women in there, female bodies in there. Um, but there's a kind of expanded, uh, expanded genderless sphere, right? Where um, the animals are not so gendered that they have to be one thing or another. And they have agency in a way that is not overdetermined by gender. And they, they act in these narratives that, that could be many things. I mean, when you say I'm a bad feminist, like that's, you know, that's hilarious and direct. Um, but I see there being a lot of, um, a lot of openness and a way to consider equality and agency and determination through these characters that isn't primarily overshadowed by, um, sort of by gender. I don't know if you feel that way about them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think that um, in um, some native stories, I've never seen the the animals take on a gender, and sometimes they clearly do take on a gender. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah, I mean, I like your interpretation of that. That's that's that's. I wish I could just have you speak for me. <laughs> I, don't know, I just I don't know. Yeah. Um, I just really, I love your work a lot. So um, this is such an honor and such a pleasure. And uh, I hope the first of many conversations that we'll have. Okay. All right. And maybe sometime actually even in person again, that would be, that would be awesome. Yeah. 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 And I don't have to worry about the dog barking or, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, we will uh, invite everyone to uh, stay on um, a moment longer to uh, hear from uh, our uh, Davis student guide, uh, Ryan Rowe, class of uh, 23. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that everyone came out tonight um, for our wonderful event. I want to give a big thank you to Julie Buffalo Head, to Lisa Fishman, and of course, to all of our attendees for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you can join us for our upcoming events at the Davis. 
our handmade photography today, a virtual artist talk series. Um, will continue with David Benjamin Sherry on Thursday, May 13th and Pushpamala N on Wednesday, May 26th. Lastly, our mindful meditation program continues on May 18th. To learn more about our programs, please visit thedavis.org. And again, thank you.